today, uh, we're going to be continuing our sermon series uh, called Wisdom Cries Out Loud, Seeking Truth in a Noisy Culture. And uh, I don't know about you, but nothing screams louder in my life than just the thought of money. I have a love-hate relationship with it. It can make me happy, and it make me completely sad. And I don't believe I'm the only one who feels that way. I know that oftentimes money offers great promises to us. It offers security, and it offers some sort of peace and comfort. But it all often falls short of that. We often believe somehow with it that we don't either make enough money. I know at my job, I believe that I'm underpaid and I'm probably not the only one who believes that too. <laughs> Most of us believe we deserve more. And there's a problem in that in that sometimes that can turn us into mismanaging our money. That can turn into going out and spending money and getting ourselves into trouble with overspending and and mismanaging. Just a few quick numbers. In the U.S., Americans all together right now, currently, if we add all the credit card debt and we have the total number for all Americans, it's at $1 trillion. $1 trillion. 42% of Americans live paycheck to paycheck. Almost 30% have less than $1,000 in their savings account. And 10 million people have no bank account whatsoever. And as I was prepping this sermon, I don't know if you're aware, but there's many great financial gurus out there, uh, great websites, blogs for debt relief. But as I was researching this, uh, I came across a great a video clip that's just super helpful. And so, uh, Myra, you mind playing that clip for us? So help us with our debt relief. I think the reason that clip is so funny is because it's so true, because the truth is so simple on how we should manage our money when it comes to debt. Um, But as Americans, clearly, we need to act our wage, W-A-G-E, And the American church, sadly, the American church, uh, giving doesn't seem to be a big priority. Uh, Listen to these facts. So in a typical church, only 10% to 25% are actual consistent givers. 37% of regular committed church attendees don't give any money to the church. Today, the average Christian gives about 2.5% of their income. And during the Great Depression, people gave 3.3%. So during the Great Depression, the hardest time in our country's history, people gave more to the church. Um, And I know in California, it's tough. We do have high taxes. We do have high mortgages. But when I look at that stat, I think that our excuses probably aren't good enough. But clearly the bottom line is that I believe that I need help with my finances, and I believe you do too. And I know that this is a sour subject in the church, that this isn't talked about a lot. This is something that we really don't want to think about. But God does. God talks about it in his word over 2,350 times. And it was 15% of what Jesus taught about. So this morning, we're going to need some help in this. I want to start by praying and asking the Holy Spirit to guide my words. And so let's pray. Lord, we come before you this morning and we ask that you would just humble us, God. That you would take, God, just my fumbled, monotone words and you would give me you. That you would take uh, my foot washing water and turn it into wine. That you would 
hide me behind your word and that we would stand on your truth this morning and that we would be encouraged by your gospel, who you are and what you've done and how generous you've been to us and let that ignite for us our view on how we should act with our money. And so God, be with us this morning and encourage us this morning and just teach us something new and remind us of some good old truths too, Lord. We love you. We thank you. We praise you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So guys, go ahead and turn to 1 Peter 4.10. And it'll, if you don't have your Bible, it'll be right behind me. And so as I mentioned, there are over 2,350 verses on money. And just step back, and I'm stepping back today and getting a, a bigger picture of God's gifts that he gives to us in, in bringing up 1 Peter uh, 4.10. So 1 Peter 4.10 says this, as each has received a gift, in the Greek that gift is, actually says gracious gift, added the word, adds the word gracious to it. So as each has received a gracious gift, use it to serve one another as good stewards, as good administrators, as good managers of God's varied, this is a diverse, like a goodie bag full of grace. Let's stop right there. Ponder the first few words. Each has received a gift. From A to Z, from Genesis to Revelation, God is so generous towards his people. We see his generosity right from the get-go in creation. Even in Genesis 1, as we read about the creation and how he created the world, we skim over verses like verse 116 where it says, he also made the stars. Do you know that there are over 100,000 million stars speaking of the generosity and the bigness of our God? And that verse is typically one we could just gloss right over as we read Genesis 1. Lately, I've been glued to Planet Earth on Netflix. Planet Earth 2 just came out on Netflix, and I've been watching that. And uh, the quality of the cameras continually get better. And what that's doing is that is letting the, the cameraman zoom in on little animals that normally we wouldn't even pay attention to. A little bugs that have 85 colors on them. I mean, the, the genius and the generosity of our God to give us eye candy with little things like the bugs that fly all around us. He's been so generous. And the garden, he gives us life itself. We're made in the image and the likeness of him. We're able to breathe. We're given a heartbeat. We're given a mind and a soul. We're given a purpose. That's to rule. That's to reign over his creation. That's to steward what he has given us. And so throughout the Old Testament, mankind though, and I don't know if you're starting a Bible reading plan and you're in Genesis going into Exodus right about now, but if you're like me, you're seeing that man is pretty messed up. That throughout the Old Testament, God continually shows grace upon grace upon grace from Abraham to Moses. I'm going to pull Psalm 78 that says this, He divided the sea and let them pass through it and made the waters stand like a heap. This is God saving his people, making a way for his people, dividing the sea. Verse 14, In the daytime he led them in a cloud and all the night with a fiery light. And he provides for them, in verse 15, by splitting rocks in the wilderness and gave them drink abundantly as from the deep. He made the streams come out of the rock and caused waters to flow down like rivers. So here God displays ultimate grace and generosity to his people as he continually provides for them. He is so good. But the biggest and the best way that displays God's generosity was at the cross of Christ. 
Here at the cross of Christ, we see the ultimate gift. Turn with me to Ephesians 2, 8 and 10. As this is one of the life mission classics that we have here. In, in earlier verses, it talks about how, but God, being rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, he made us alive together in Christ. And continuing on in verse 8, says this, For by grace you have been saved through faith. This is not of your own doing. We have to remind ourselves that it is a gift from God. What we cherish and what we love and what we possess the most in our lives is a gift from God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. Has your soul been awakened by the grace of God? Has your soul been ignited by the generosity of our God? Have you seen throughout the Old Testament and at the cross just how good our God is? Have you tasted and seen That our Lord is good? How good is our God? Because when I hear, when I remember, when I believe, what I actually say I believe, and what I stake and claim my life on, which is this, that I was so in debt, and the payment that I had to make was more than I could pay. I couldn't pay it. I brought nothing to the table of God except for my sin. In 30 minutes or so, we'll take communion, remembering the broken body and the blood shed, and we bring nothing to the table except our sin and our worship to him for it, taking and removing it. In Romans 6.23, it says this, For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. It's a free gift where he exchanges and takes on death for us. He removes it. It was our generous Father who gave his one and only Son. He purchased me with his priceless blood. He clothed me in a robe that I can't buy. He clothes me and takes me to a store that I can't afford. And there's no way I could buy what he clothes me in. He clothes me in his righteousness. God gives grace. And he has been so good to us. From creation to the cross and in our current lives, we could all testify as we remember the goodness of God in our lives. But why is he so generous to us? Why does he continually bless us? I mean, he saves us. Then he gives us the Holy Spirit And then he allows us to be on mission with him. Why does he bless us? Why does he give us money? Let's reread and go back to 1 Peter 4.10. It says this, As each has received a gift, so use it to serve one another as stewards of God's varied grace. Whoever speaks as one who speaks oracles of God, whoever preaches the gospel, whoever serves as one who serves by the strength that God supplies, says this, whatever we're doing, whatever gift God gives you, and however however you use that, it's so that in order that in everything God may be glorified through Jesus Christ, it's to him belong the glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Amen. So church, we are here, as you know, as I state every single week in our greeting, to glorify God. And it doesn't change with our wallets. The gospel motivates and fuels generosity in everything, this verse says. In everything. 
Jonathan Edwards calls this idea grace made visible. Where we have been shown grace. Now we are given so much to make grace visible to a lost and to a dying world. And this includes my time, my treasure, and my talents. So how do I make the gift of God that he has given to me visible? I mean, in 2018, how do we make grace visible? How should the good news affect my giving in my wallet? Let's go to Luke 19, 1 through 10, and a good story here. A good story that some of us may be able to sing the song. This is about Zacchaeus, the wee little man, and the wee little man was he. I won't try to sing it. I, I, I was going to, but I'm not. Um, so verse, verse 1, it says, He, Jesus, entered Jericho and was passing through, and behold, there was a man named Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector, and he was rich. And so you can tell Jesus has gained a lot of momentum in his ministry. It's become popular. The crowds are crowding around him and that Zacchaeus wants a peek. And it says in verse 3, And he was see seeking to see who Jesus was, and on account of the crowd he could not, because he was small in stature. So he ran on ahead and he climbed into a sycamore tree to see, for he was about to pass that way. And when Jesus came to the place, he looked up to him. And he said, Zacchaeus, hurry and come down, for I must stay in your house today. So Zacchaeus hurried. So he hurried, and he came down and he received him joyfully. He received, he received, he received a gift. He received him joyfully. Verse 7, and when they saw it, they all grumbled. He, he has gone in to be the guest of a man who is a sinner. And Zacchaeus stood and said to the Lord, he said, Behold, Lord, the half of my goods. So here is the effects of Zacchaeus receiving a gift. Behold, Lord, the half of my goods I give to the poor. And if I have defrauded anyone of anything, I restore it fourfold, times four. And Jesus said to him, today salvation has come to this house, since he has also is a son of Abraham. For the son of man came to seek and came to save the lost. That is the Lord we love. What amazed Jesus here, what showed Jesus proof of Zacchaeus' transformation and conversion was that his eyes were opened and his hands were open. That he loosened his grip on his finances when he got saved. And he became generous. And this is like the director of the IRS. And he takes and he completely changes and starts giving money back to people that he may, might have taken in a way that he shouldn't. That's like unheard of. And coming back and paying four times the amount. This is what happens when we see the glory of God. Our gods are replaced. See, Zacchaeus is old God, money, was completely discarded. And this was the evidence of his real transformation. There's a quote in your notes that says, it's by Martin Luther. It says that there are three conversions for the Christian. The conversion of the heart, the conversion of our minds, and the conversion of our wallets. So not only does the gospel transform our hearts, it transforms our hands. So a question. What does a wallet, what does a bank statement, what does a checkbook look like that belongs to God? Here's a tough one. What gospel is your wallet preaching? 
If your wallet could talk, what would it say? What would it be proclaiming? See, stingy is not a part of the gospel. Generosity is one of the biggest evidences of God's grace in our lives. So as we cling to the cross, it loosens the grip on our money. So as we study the word of God, we realize that we are not our own, that we've been bought with a price, that God owns everything. That God owns everything. It's all God's. It is all his. David in Psalm 24 says it like this, the earth is the Lord's and everything in it. 1 Chronicles 29.12 says, With your powerful and mighty hand you rule all over. God is the owner. We are his stewards. We are his managers. Paul asks, What do you have that you did not receive? The answer is nothing. Everything that I possess and that I have in my life is from him. So even when we give to him, it's us giving to him what's already his. So when we give to him, we're giving to him what's already his. My kids, uh, when they were little, would uh, go with my wife, and this was when they were two, three, four, five years old, and they would go to the store and they try to go birthday or Christmas shopping for me. And they were too young to make money. So my wife would use our money to buy a present for me that I was at work paying for. So my kids would give me a gift that I bought. That's how we need to think about when we give to God. We are simply giving him back what is already his. It is all his. It is all God's. And it is all from God. James says it like this, every good and perfect gift comes from where? Above. From above. It's all God's. It's all from God. And he established this right from the get-go, didn't he? When he said, you, man, are going to rule and you are going to reign over this creation. You are going to steward what I'm giving you. So we are not owners, we are stewards or managers. So I'm a, I'm a project manager. I work for a design build firm and uh, I do project managing work. I oversee budgets and make sure our homes come in on budget on time. And uh, I, I say that because I'm a, a project manager. I'm not a project owner. There's a big difference between the two. If I was the project owner, obviously I would have a big investment in the, in the project. It would be mine. But I am simply walking my clients through the project, holding their hand, making sure it's a good experience for them as a manager, stewarding, their money, not my money. So we are managers. We are stewards. We are not owners. So up until this point, we've talked a little bit about how money is all God's, and we're simply stewards of it. But once we've put our stake in the ground, and we've established that it's all God's, that it's all from him, and that he has been so generous to us, then we have to ask, how? How can we be good stewards? How can we do this? James 5, 1, 5 says it like this. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask for it. Ask. If we don't know how generosity looks in your life, ask. Look to the word. Pray to the Lord. Turn to godly people that you love and respect 
to help you, to steer you in it. One of the biggest markers in generosity is wisdom. Uh, one of the best ways to battle against the love of money is to actually give it away. If you're struggling with a huge love of money, the answer is to give it away. Um, so we believe as a church in a sacrificial giving, that our giving should look sacrificial. This means for me personally what, what me and my wife do is we give God the first fruits. He gets the first. When the money comes in, the, the amount that we've decided to give to the Lord, that's what we give first. And then the mortgage is paid. And then our food is bought. But God, because he has been so generous to us, because he is so good, and because he is so worthy of our praise, not with just our voices, much more than just our voices, with our actions and with our money and with our hard work. He deserves so much. It's a story of a farmer who told a pastor about uh, one of his cows was a, had more uh, babies, more calves than he expected. He's going to give birth to two instead of one. So the farmer told the pastor that because I have two and I was expecting one, I'm going to give one to the church. Well, about a couple weeks later, the man came up to the pastor and he said, uh, the Lord's calf died. So often, this is what we do. This is what we do because we don't give the Lord his first fruits first. He has been so good to us and that's where this is coming from. It's coming from a place of worship. That as we worship God, why do we so often leave the thought of our bank account behind? And also, as we consider being generous, one of the first questions that comes to mind is, well, how much is enough? How much is enough? In the Old Testament, God required his people uh, to give 10%. This was a tithe, that the 10% of their net annual income, and it was called a tithe. Failure to give that 10% wasn't seen as stingy. It was seen as robbery. Because like I said, it's all God's. It's all His. But consider this as you consider an amount to give is that was the Old Testament. And we're on the other side of the cross. We are on the side of the cross where we have been shown grace upon grace and we have seen even more of God's generosity, not less. So how much more should we be generous to God? How much more? <clears throat> Question. Question. Consider this thought. <clears throat> We've been shown grace, mercy, given joy from our generous and gracious God. How could we be expected to be less generous, right? These are thoughts based off a Tim Keller a proverb. So he asks this too. Do you think it's reasonable to see the tithe as the minimum standard of Christian generosity. Do you think it's fair? Do you think it's reasonable to consider that the starting line, when you consider how much should I give, that it should be 10% and not below? When we see how much God has given to us and how generous that he is for us. <clears throat> We continually need to seek wisdom in this. We're not going to have all the answers today. So I want to encourage you guys to keep pressing in on this. But uh, as we get closer to the end here, um, you'll see in your notes, there's 
five uh, points there. But a great place to start asking for wisdom is the book of Proverbs. Uh, Pastor Kevin DeYoung uh, came up with 10 principles on money and possessions from the book of Proverbs. Uh, I've taken my five favorite ones. They're in your notes. So number one, the rich and the poor are more alike than they think. The rich and the poor are more alike than they think. So when we see the word rich in the word, it's referring to us. It's referring to us. So the average salary, I looked this up, the average salary in Escondido is $40,000, okay? According to the global rich list, if you make over $32,000 a year, you're at the top 1% of the world's global income. So if you make more than $32,000, you're at the top 1% of income in the entire world. We would be considered rich. The question we need to ask is, why has God given us extra here, living in Southern California, and we're at the top 1% of the entire world? Why has he decided to bless us with so much? In your notes, you'll see a quote from Randy Alcorn. It says this, God doesn't make us rich so that we can indulge ourselves and spoil our children so that we can insulate ourselves from needing God's provision. God gives us abundant material blessing so that he blesses us so that we can give it away. And we can give it away generously. He blesses us so we could bless others. Number two, you can't, you can't outgive God. You can't outgive him. I'll ask this. We've given, we've been given so much through salvation. How can my paycheck, my dollars, and what I decide to give to him, how can that ever match what he's done for me? I, at what point would I even get close? How could I ever match what he's done for me? I can't outgive him. Three, money cannot give you ultimate security. And you know what? We would all agree with that. That's a simple statement. But functionally and mentally, do we really believe that? When we worry and stress and our country's debt ratio and all the numbers we're seeing don't reflect that we believe that. We need to believe that God is our stronghold, that God is our ever-present help in our times of trouble and not our credit card. Number four, the Lord loves those who are generous to the poor. I think the word's just incredibly clear on this one. Uh, so often of what Jesus taught was about helping the poor. Those looking even around uh, the people in our lives, whether it's our neighbors, whether it's the people in our community group, just to ask ourselves, who around me is hurting? And who around me can I bless? Who needs help? Number five, and this is the one mentioned the most, uh, money isn't everything. It doesn't satisfy it doesn't satisfy us. It's nothing like having wisdom. Money doesn't come close to having wisdom. It doesn't come close to being clothed in righteousness. It's not even close to being given humility or having good relationships. All the money in all the world couldn't replace for me the thought and the idea of being in community with you guys. There's nothing that could replace that. No job opportunity anywhere else. Nothing would lure me in the ways of money. A pastoral position paid somewhere else. I'd like to tell you guys right now that I've been offered seven of those, but I haven't. <laughs> but nothing should ever divide us when it comes to money. But in closing, like I said, I know this is a touch, touchy subject for us. 
I know that this gets into territory and makes us defensive. I know that I'm touching areas of your life that you don't want to enter into and challenge yourself into. I know that a lot of us will hear the message today and we'll dismiss it with times are tough. Do you know what I pay in taxes? Do you know what my mortgage payment is? But think about the Great Depression and how the giving was more. Think about how generous that our God has been in the day that we go to meet him and the idea that we would come up with weak excuses about why we are not generous to God. I want to encourage you with a few things to ask yourself as we close. It's this. How can I be more generous in 2018? Coming up with a plan. Maybe you need to start by creating a budget and adding giving as a line item on it. Whether that's giving to your neighbors, to the church, to the homeless around Escondido, whatever that may look like for you. Adding a generosity line item to your budget. And if you don't have one, um, create a budget and uh, again add giving to it. But maybe it's also this. It's just you're already giving, but adding a percentage to it every year. I know Joby and Katie do that every year is they try to add one percentage to their giving every single year. Your pastor is living out a living testimony to what we are preaching today. Um, so that if you decide to do that, just to give you some rough numbers based off normal salaries, if you did decide to add 1% to your salary, we're talking about like $30 to $80 a month. It's not like a ton of money. Um, so that's an idea. And then uh, also uh, budgeting for evangelism. Uh, I know as a church, we've been definitely moving into that territory where we want to reach the lost. We've been preaching that for years and years and years, and we've been more practically applying uh, and talking about this in, in and through our community groups much more uh, in the last year. And uh, a lot of the times, the way to reach people who do, don't know Jesus is actually by being generous and giving them some money, whether it's buying some tickets to you know, a pottery game and taking them, or taking them uh, out to dinner, or having them over for dinner. Uh, but you have to have a plan to do those things. Those things don't just show up, and we don't always do them because we don't always have the money to do them. So it's planning ahead and figuring out ways that we can actually do the things that I know we want to do. And um, last, I think it's this. I think it's, it's opening up the conversation. It's opening up the money conversation. We have so many fight clubs. I've had so many fight clubs with so many people throughout the years. So many one-on-one -on -one meetings where we talk about sin. Where we talk about the most in-depth parts of our soul. But we need to open up this one too. We need to be honest. Like, hey, I stink with my money. I'm in debt. I don't know what I'm doing. I buy things I don't need. What am I doing here? I mean, let's be honest. And that's where, in and through our transparency, that God can truly move and truly work. So I want to encourage you guys as you gather in your community groups to look at the community group homework this week, to study it, to look at the probing questions on the back, and to be willing and open to talk about this with someone else. <clears throat> so, Last, we believe we are stewards of God's grace. That we have been shown so much. That we are saved by grace. And we've been shown so much about God's generosity throughout the years of our lives. That this truth, that we've been saved by grace, should touch every area of our lives. Especially our finances. We do this by his grace, and we do this for his glory. His glory. This is our life mission. Let's pray.
God, you have been so generous to us through creation to the cross. You have been so good. You have saved us by your amazing grace. You have opened up our eyes and we are witnesses to your goodness and to your love and to your mercy. We have seen it in our lives. We have seen it in our lives through your creation. We have seen it through your word and we have seen it through the people that you've brought into our lives that have been gracious to us. God, I want to thank you for this church and I want to thank you for each and every generous person that is here. I thank you for all the people who have blessed me and my family throughout the years that have blessed me with encouraging prayers or a little gift. I thank you for the generosity of this church and I pray that you would increase in us each one of us, more. We want more wisdom. We want more generosity in our lives. And we want to smash the idol of money in our lives. We love you, God. We come before you thanking you. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.